Good thing that I don't, never have to hear my voice on these recordings. <laughs> uh, yeah, welcome everybody. I hope everybody's doing, doing well. Happy Wednesday. Um, I want to get started first by reminding everybody of our community um, statement. And so some of the guidelines that, that we've um, come up with are that, um, well, there's three. We are all learning. So, um, you know, this is, a, this is a learning seminar. So while very abstract topics are discussed, um, speakers give, you know, examples and we can ask questions and feel comfortable in just the learning environment. Um, the second one is that everyone has something to contribute. Um, everybody has different, uh, is at different academic levels. So, um, but, but every, everybody has something meaningful to, to contribute. And the last one is no one has all the answers, not even the speaker. <laughs> so um, that, that means that we just have to be patient and maybe we can answer each other's questions and definitely make use of the, of the chat. Um, <laughs> but there's an answer to all questions. Yeah, I guess, I don't know, is also a suitable answer, but 42 seems to be what Theo's saying. Um, yeah, so welcome everybody, and hopefully we can abide by those, those guidelines. Um, and so today, I'm very happy to, to introduce my dear friend, uh, Maria Supina, who's uh, um, finishing her PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. And she'll be talking to us about the universal valuation of coxeter matroids um, from a polytopal view. So let's welcome um, Muriel. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Andres. I'm really excited to be able to um, talk about this work in this graduate online combinatorics colloquium. Um, so there's kind of like four key words in my title, universal valuation, Coxeter and matroids. And I'll try to unpack all of that. So don't be worried if um, some of these words are unfamiliar to you. Um, so to start, um, I, okay, hopefully the slides are changing and that's working. Um, so this is um, based on a paper that I wrote jointly with Chris Yur and Mario Sanchez. And so you can find our preprint on the archive if you like. It's called The Universal Valuation of Coxeter Matroids, the same as the title of the talk. Um, so I want to start I want to start by um, talking about subdivisions of polyhedra. So throughout the talk, we'll be working with various families of polyhedra that live in some vector space V. So here script P is going to be some family of polyhedra and later we'll specialize this to be generalized permutahedra or deformations of polytopes or matroids and I'll get into that. But for now, it's just any family of polyhedra that you want. Um, and so if I have some polyhedron P um, in that family, a subdivision of P is going to be a set Q1 through QK of polyhedra in the family such that um, their union is P and they're all the same dimension as P and they only use vertices from P. And very importantly, if you intersect any two of them, you need to get something that's a face of both of them. So here's, that's like a lot of conditions, but here's, here's an example that will hopefully make that pretty clear. So um, here, my family is just all polyhedra that live in R2 and the polyhedron that I'm gonna subdivide is the square P and I subdivide it into Q1 and Q2 here, these two triangles. And um, you can see that these triangles only use vertices that are in P. And importantly, if you intersect them, you get this diagonal line, this edge, that's a face of both Q1 and Q2. So this is a subdivision. So when we're working with subdivisions of polyhedra, the functions that we want to consider that are compatible with these subdivisions are called valuations. Um, so what is evaluation? It's going to be a function from the family of polyhedra to some abelian group such that you can compute the value of the function on some polyhedron by um, subdividing the polyhedron and kind of doing inclusion exclusion on the faces of the subdivision. So here in this formula, um, I'm summing over subsets of 
the numbers one through K, which is the, um, which correspond to the polyhedra in the subdivision. And when I have the subset I, this just corresponds to intersecting all of the QI for I in that set, subset. Um, so um, some examples of this include um, Euclidean volume of polytopes, um, Earhart polynomials of lattice polytopes, if you know about those. Um, and there's another one here that I wrote, which is that um, if you have any affine half space um, living in V, um, then you can define evaluation into um, the integers by um, F of P is going to be one if P is contained in that closed half space and zero otherwise. So let me just go back to the previous slide and look at an example. Um, so for example, if I, if I take um, the half space, so I take, let's say I take the hyperplane or the line in this case that just goes along this diagonal between Q1 and Q2, and I take the half space that's below that line, the closed half space. Um, so then um, P is not contained in that half space. So the, the function should evaluate to zero. And we can see that um, if, I, if I evaluate, so for this to be evaluation, this should be the same as evaluating the function on Q1 plus Q2 minus their intersection. And indeed, if I take the function evaluated on Q1, that's not contained in the half space, so I get zero. Q2 is contained, so I get one, but then their intersection is also contained in the half space, so I subtract one and then I get zero again, so this, this works. Um, and there's many other examples of evaluations on polyhedra. Um, so that was sort of the polytopal view, and I told you that this would be a polytopal view. Um, but I do want to sort of give another definition of valuations um, that is more of an algebraic definition. Um, so another way to think about valuations is that um, what I'm going to do is for every uh, polyhedron in the family, I'm going to get an indicator function of that polyhedron. I'm not saying this is evaluation, this is a different thing. Um, so corresponding to a polyhedron, I have this indicator function that's defined on elements of the vector space where um, one sub P of X is going to be one if X is the point in the polyhedron and zero otherwise. And then what I can do is I can, um, I can take all of the integer finite integer linear combinations of these indicator functions, and I'm going to call that I of the family P. And so this is the Z module of indicator functions. So um, another way to describe evaluation is that evaluation is a function from the family of polytopes to an abelian group that basically factors through the indicator, the indicator module. So there needs to be some um, Z linear map um, F tilde from the indicator functions to the abelian group such that it agrees with, with um, F when you evaluate it at the indicator function of a polytope or a polyhedron. So kind of um, like this looks totally different than what I said before about inclusion exclusion on a subdivision, but what you should think about is that um, this indicator module kind of models valuativeness because um, the indicator functions in this Z module sort of have this inclusion exclusion relation kind of built in. So what, so an example of this is that if you take the indicator function of P plus that of Q, you should get the indicator function of P union Q plus that of P intersection Q. Um, and so if we break this down, we can see that on the left hand side of this equation, if I plug in a point X, I should get two if X is in both P and Q, one if x is in only p or q but not both and zero otherwise and then you can convince yourself that that's also what you would get if you if you evaluate the other side on some point x um, so this is another way to think about valuations um, and so the reason i wanted to give this definition is because it's easier to talk about what a universal valuation should be if i if we think of it in this more algebraic um, perspective so, okay, so here's, this is a commutative diagram that basically is saying exactly what I just said. This is, represents the definition of evaluation. 
So in some sense, what I'm saying is that um, evaluation is the same as a Z linear function on the indicator module. Um, okay, so a universal valuation should be a, um, a valuation, so a function from P to some abelian group that we can pick. Um, and it needs to be a valuation. And we want to be able to get every other valuation that's possible as like a specialization of this universal valuation. Um, so, um, but, but as I just said, evaluation is the same as a Z linear function on the indicator module. And to choose a Z linear function, all I need to do is come up with a basis for the, the module of indicator functions and define a value on every basis element. And that is how you define a function on here. Um, so I'm going to next show a bigger commutative diagram, which hopefully is not too horrible. Um, <laughs> it kind of looks horrible, but okay, hopefully it's not too bad. Um, so, okay, so on the bottom left part, you have the same one from before. So that part is just what it means to be evaluation. Um, and then um, this sort of arch on the top is what we want out of our universal valuation. So we want there to be, for any valuation f, we want there to be a unique phi such that f equals phi composed with the universal valuation. And so what we need to do basically um, in order to like have the universal valuation be as general as possible and not lose any information is to write our polyhedron. So take the polyhedron, send it to its, its indicator function, and then just write that out in terms of a basis. And that is like, doesn't lose any information, I guess, that we would need to define evaluation. So that's going to be what a universal valuation should look like. You choose a basis of the indicator functions, and then you write it out. You write out P, you write out the indicator function of P in terms of that basis. Um, so, so this is what a universal valuation should be. And the hard part here is finding a basis for the indicator functions. Um, and so that's what we were trying to do for certain special families of polytopes. Um, so I'll, I'll go on to say like our special families and hopefully that will, will kind of make things a little clearer. Although feel free to also ask questions if you have them. Um, so, Throughout, um, so to start, I guess, we will focus on the case where our family of polytopes is the family of deformations of some special polytope Q. Um, so what I mean by this is that if I have some polytope Q, um, if you know what the normal fan of a polytope is, then you should think that a deformation of Q is another polyhedron P such that the normal fan of P coarsens a subfan of the normal fan of Q. And if you don't know what the normal fan is, then you should just kind of think of this, this picture that I'm showing in this example. So if you start with your polytope Q that you're deforming, here it's this hexagon, um, a deformation is what you get by kind of sliding out the facets of, of your polytope along their normals. So here, um, to go from Q to P1, for example, I would take that kind of upper right um, edge and I just slide it out along its normal as far as I can. And that gives me, that gets me from Q to P1. So P1 is a deformation of Q. Um, and likewise for, for P2, I can obtain that from Q by kind of, um, choosing like the four like lower left and lower edges and sort of taking turns like sliding them out as far as I can and eventually I can slide some of them out all the way to infinity and I get this cone p2 so it doesn't need the deformation doesn't need to be bounded um, so so when you think of deformations you should think of taking a polytope and kind of sliding out the the facets as much as you can or as or in any way that you can um that that like doesn't yeah until you like can't do it anymore i guess um so so this is what i mean by deformations um and so we're going to focus on the case where we're working with a family of deformations of some polytope q um so, okay, yeah, so 
there's two sort of other polytope kind of definitions that I need to give, and I'm just going to give them both by pictures again. <laughs> so, um, so when I have some polytope, um, I'm going to say that a tangent cone of the of a polytope of that polytope at some face is just going to be the cone of all the edge directions that are incident to that face. So here, there's two examples. On the left, you have um, this hexagon with this at this vertex V. And so the tangent cone will just be the cone of like the horizontal and vertical edges that are coming out of V. And so you get this yellow cone here. Um, and in the second one, I'm taking the tangent cone at this, this edge F. So it's going to be the cone of the, the edge F, but also um, like the affine span of the edge F, but also um, the cone over the the two edges that are that touch F. And so you get this whole yellow half space here. Um, and so um, one important thing is that these tangent cones are going to always be deformations of, of the polytope. Um, so the second definition, which is kind of related, is that of tight containment of a polyhedron in a cone. So um, here I have two examples and two non-examples of tight containment. So what I mean is that a polyhedron is tightly contained in a cone. If it's contained in the cone and it intersects the, the lowest dimensional face of the cone, the lineality space of the cone. So in my two good examples, um, I have this hexagon that's contained in the pink cone and it intersects the cone at the, the point of the cone. And in the second one, the triangle is in this half space and it intersects the lineality space. So both of those are examples of tight containment. And the other two are not examples because neither of those yellow polytopes intersect the cone in the lowest dimensional face in the point. Um, so one important thing to note, again, is that tangent cones of a polytope, um, you, you'll always be able to like translate them to the face that, that they correspond to, and then the polytope will be tightly contained in that translation of the tangent cone. So notice that if I take this CV from the upper left picture and I translate it up by V, so the origin is now at V, then the whole polytope is tightly contained in its tangent cone. Um, so these definitions are what we need in order to define um, a universal valuation for um, a family of deformations of some polytope. I have a question, yeah. um, and there's a question in the chat afterwards, but I'll, I'll just I'll say mine first. Um, mm -hmm. So you said for the second example with the CF that somehow this edge and the edges incident to it mattered, but I'm not really seeing how the edges incident to it are having an effect. It, to me, this just looks like you're taking the edge F. Does that make sense? I see. Yeah, yeah. So, so if I just took um, the directions of the edge F, I would only get the line through the origin. So in order to get the half space, I need to take the cone of like the edge going in both directions, oh, I see. like both so orientations and also the two incident. Yeah, so it's saying that, yeah. that that gives us like a direction because otherwise we wouldn't necessarily know which direction or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, Vic, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Polytope and the cone have to have the same affine span, like in those pictures, or is that not necessary? Um, I think we don't insist that, but I also think all of the examples or like all of the applications that I'm going to do will have that. Um, okay. Thanks. So, yeah. Was there any other questions? Or should I? Um, okay, so so our first uh, our first um, we have one oh, more question. Sorry. Yeah. Well, Seth asks, um, is the tangent cone is the tangent cone based on the origin? Yeah. So the tangent cone is is going to be like a a linear cone. Like it'll be it'll it'll include the origin um, in its lineality space. But, um, but what we're going to end up doing is kind of like translating the tangent cone around the plane or the, the space so that it, it doesn't have to be at the origin anymore. But, but how I've defined it, it's at the origin and then we're going to sort of translate it around. 
later. Well, in a, one slide. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for those questions. Um, so, okay, so, so what we did was we used this to define a universal valuation on a family of deformations of some polytope. So this is our first, our first results. So if Q is some polytope that we're deforming, then um, remember to define a universal valuation for its family of deformations. All I need to do is find a basis for the space of indicator functions of those deformations. And so we were able to show that um, translations of tangent cones of Q, the, the special polytope that we're deforming, um, these form a basis for the indicator module. Um, and so from there, we were able to show that um, we were able, able to describe a universal valuation for a family of deformations of some polytope. And this is given by just taking your polytope. So, so if I have P, which is a deformation of Q, I'm going to take P, I'm going to, and I'm going to map it to um, all of the, basically a formal sum of all of the translations of tangent cones that tightly contain P, tangent cones of Q that tightly contain P. Um, and I think I have, I have a picture of, of what this looks like uh, in a few slides. So hopefully that will like help a little bit. Um, so this is like sort of the general version of our result, which works for any family of deformations of some polytope. Um, so we care about sort of a special family of, of deformations or deformations of a very special polytope in combinatorics, um, which is called the permutahedron. Um, so the n permutahedron, pi n, is going to be the convex hull of all permutations of the coordinates of the point um, 1, 2, up to n in Rn. So we have one of these in each dimension, um, and it's always going to be co-dimension 1. So here we have the 3 permutahedron, which is a hexagon, and the 4 permutahedron, which is the green polytope. So a generalized permutahedron is an element of the family of deformations of the permutahedron. Um, and another way to say this is that it's a polyhedron with edge and ray directions of the form EI minus EJ for standard basis vectors EI and EJ. Um, so it's clear from this definition that um, permutahedra and, and then generalized permutahedra as well are really closely linked to the symmetric group because you get the permutahedron by taking the symmetric group orbit of this point and taking the convex hull. And also, if you're familiar with root systems, you may notice that the edge directions of a generalized permutahedron um, need to be of the form EI minus EJ, which is the roots of the type A root system, which corresponds to the symmetric group. Um, so, um, in, oops, in Coxeter combinatorics, um, we often like to consider combinatorial objects that are associated to any finite reflection group, not necessarily SN. So, um, so a lot of the things that people usually study in combinatorics are like, in, like intrinsically related to the symmetric group, but sometimes we want to study things that are related to other reflection groups. Um, so by a reflection group, I just mean that it's a finite group obtained from, <clears throat> sorry, I need a drink of water. <clears throat> um, it's a finite group obtained from reflecting across some hyperplanes uh, in V. Um, and so not every collection of hyperplanes that you reflect across will form a finite group, but, um, but there's certain special collections of hyperplanes that do. And we're going to let R be the set of normal vectors of those hyperplanes that you reflect across. And then we call the pair phi, which is V, R, um, we call this a root system. So the, the type A root system, so we call these like A, B, C, and D, but type A um, is the one that I've been working with, which corresponds to the symmetric group. Um, and so the roots here are just the vectors EI minus EJ. And so you can see that these are the normals to the hyperplanes Xi equals Xj. And reflecting across these hyperplanes kind of or transposes two coordinates of a point. And by doing that in all the possible ways, we get all of Sn, all the permutations. Um, so there's three other um, infinite families of 
of uh, root systems, finite root systems that I've listed here. Um, and I've listed what the roots are in these different families. Um, and so in Coxeter combinatorics, we like to like think about things that are associated to these reflection groups instead of just the symmetric group all the time. Um, so analogous to the generalized permutahedra, I can define generalized Coxeter permutahedra. So um, I'll define for a root system phi, I'll define the phi permutahedron to be the convex hull of the reflection group orbit of a generic point in V. So here a generic point just means that it doesn't lie on any of the hyperplanes um, in the reflection group. So here is two examples. Um, I have the B2 and the B3 permutahedron. <clears throat> um, and then we can define a generalized Coxeter permutahedron to be a deformation of the, this Coxeter permutahedron. And equivalently, we can say, just like in type A, we can say that it's a polyhedron with its edge and ray directions in the roots, the set of roots. Um, so you can see that generalized permutahedra and generalized Coxeter permutahedra are special families of deformations. And so, um, our results about the universal valuation on a family of deformations like gives us immediately as a corollary the universal valuation for generalized Coxeter permutahedra. Um, and so this is the corollary. So the universal valuation of generalized Coxeter permutahedra is given by a formal, so mapping a poly, polytope or polyhedron, a generalized Coxeter permutahedron P to a formal sum of all of the translated tangent cones of the, the phi permutahedron that tightly contain P. And so um, in type A, so for generalized permutahedra, this was proven by Dirksen and Fink in 2010. And then um, Chris and Mario and I generalized this to um, Coxeter, generalized Coxeter permutahedra um, in our paper. So um, here is an example of kind of what this looks like. So this is, um, so this, this triangle, you can think of this as a deformation of the, the hexagon, which is the, the three permutahedron in type A. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to um, map this to the, a formal sum of all of the translated vertex cones of the hexagon that tightly contain um, this triangle. And so um, basically for each, um, for each of the six vertex cones of the hexagon, there's like exactly one translation of it that we can do so that um, the triangle is tightly contained. And so you can see I kind of, so, so really we're just summing over these six cones or these nine cones, um, but I, I put the triangle in there so you can see like how how it needs to be translated so that it's tightly contained. Um, and so this, this gives us uh, the universal valuation um, for generalized Coxeter permutahedra. Um, are, there, are there any questions? Or should I go on? Okay. Um, okay, so so this, this answers the question for generalized Coxeter permutahedra, but, but in my title, I said I would talk about Coxeter matroids. So I, and I haven't said the word matroid yet, so, so I need to talk about matroids now. So we're going to shift gears back to just type A and the symmetric group. Um, and let's talk about, about matroids. So um, there's a lot of different ways to define a matroid, but I'm just going to think of them as polytopes for this talk. Um, so if you know about other definitions of matroids, you should think about that, but, um, but I'm just gonna talk about the polytope definition. Um, so matroids are combinatorial objects that generalize the notion of independence, and they are a subfamily of generalized permutahedra. But in fact, they're not themselves a family of, of deformations of something. They're just a family of polytopes that lives inside this, the deformations of the permutahedron. Um, so 
A matroid is, for the purposes of this talk, it's a polytope with edge directions of the form EI minus EJ and vertices that lie in um, 0, 1 to the n. So in other words, matroid polytopes are all of the generalized permutahedra that have vertices that are 0, 1 ve uh, vectors. Um, and this isn't part of the definition, but it sort of follows from the definition it, the definition um, that all of the vertices of a matroid polytope will have the same number of zeros and ones. Be and this comes from the fact that the edge directions have to have this, this special form. Um, so here pictured is an example of a matroid polytope. Um, in, uh, so it's a, this is a, a deformation of, of the four permutahedron. Um, so there's a special family of polytopes called uniform matroids, um, a special subfamily of matroids called uniform matroids. Um, so as I mentioned, all the vertices of a matroid will have the same number of ones, and we call that the rank of the matroid. So for some um, integer r between 1 and n, the uniform matroid is going to be the convex hull of all of the 0, 1 vectors that have exactly r ones and n minus r zeros. Um, and this is kind of special because all of the other matroids of rank r are going to be contained inside the uniform matroid u r n because um, their vertices have to be a subset of these vertices. Um, so here is an example. This is U24. So you can see it's just all of the 0, 1 vectors that have two ones and two zeros. Um, and then you take the convex hull. And so any other matroid of rank 2 um, in R4 needs to live inside of this, this uniform matroid. So um, so this talk is about matroid valuations, and the reason why people care about these is because matroid subdivisions have a lot of connections to geometry, or one reason why people care about these. Um, and this includes compactifications of fine Schubert cells, tropical geometry, and K-theory of Grassmannians. Um, and I, I would say that I have approached this from a more combinatorial side, so I'm not really able to answer questions about these things, but I'm definitely interested in learning more about these applications. And um, if you do know about these things, then, then you should think about, about that during this talk. Um, so, uh, so a matroid valuation, um, okay, so, so, so we wanna find now a universal valuation for matroids, let's say, just forget the coxeter part, just type A matroids. Um, so, uh, so we can do this by starting with the universal valuation of generalized permutahedra that I mentioned before and, um, and seeing what we get when we evaluate this on matroids. Um, so, um, so uh, we have a question, oh, from, yeah, yeah. Um, which is, can you relate your definition to one of the well-known definitions of matroids? Yes, thank you. I meant to do that and I forgot. Thank you. Um, so if you know, so if you can think of a matroid as its set of bases, so in the usual definition, then this matroid polytope is going to be the convex hull of the indicator uh, vectors of the bases. So like, um, so like in this case, it would be the bases would be 1, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 1, 4, and one, three, because those are the zero, one vectors that appear. Yeah. Um, was there any other questions? So I guess a follow up for me. So technically we would think of this shape here as living in four dimensional space, but yeah. maybe in this specific circumstance, it's actually like you can see it in three dimensions or. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of wrote it as it's living in four dimensional space, but really um, like, sort of in, in type A, we can think of everything as like um, up to like translation by the, the all ones vector. So, so it's kind of living in three dimensional space if you sort of like do that, that quotient, but um, it's easier to, to just think about it as living in four dimensional space for me, I guess. Um, oh, and then we have a, another follow up from Seth mm -hmm. um, about uh, 
how does the basis exchange axiom get there? Yeah, so, um, so this has to do with the fact that the edge directions have the form EI minus EJ. Um, so, so like if two vertices are connected by an edge, then there's like some like basis exchange operation that you can do to get from, from one to the other. So that's like kind of one way that it shows up. Um, yeah. Is there any other questions? Okay. Um, okay, so, so let's say we want to find um, the universal valuation for matroids. So let's go back to this universal valuation for generalized permutahedra. Um, and remember that this takes a generalized permutahedron and it maps it to a formal sum of all of the translated tangent codes of the permutahedron that tightly contain P. Um, so what happens when we evaluate this on a matroid um, of rank R? Well, we know from before that this matroid of rank R needs to live inside the uniform matroid of rank R. Um, and so we don't really need to think about the entire tangent cone C plus V. We only need to think about the part that like intersects or the intersection with the, the uniform matroid. Um, and so and so if we can intersect these tangent cones with the uniform matroid and get um, another like element of the of the family or the indicator function of another element of the family, um, then we can describe the universal valuation that way. So, um, so in this case, um, if we take a translated tangent cone of the permutahedron and we intersect it with the uniform matroid of rank R, then we're going to get a different matroid, which is called a Schubert matroid. Um, it's actually going to be like some a Schubert matroid up to permutation. So a Schubert matroid possibly like acted on by some element of the symmetric group. Um, so a Schubert matroid, um, if we have a Schubert matroid means that basically we fix a vertex of the uniform matroid of rank R. Um, so some V with R ones and and minus R zeros. And then the Schubert matroid is going to be the convex hull of all of the other zero one vectors in Rn that are with R1s um, that are lexicographically bigger than V. Um, and so up to permutation, when we intersect these tangent cones with the uniform matroid, we get these Schubert matroids. And so, um, and so Dirksen and Fink were able to use this to show the universal valuative invariant for matroids. So um, so a valuative invariant basically means that we want a valuation that doesn't, it, it evaluates the same on every element, every um, element of the orbit of some, some matroid. So if I have a matroid polytope um, and I act on it by some element of the symmetric group by permuting all the coordinates, um, then the valuation F should give me the same value on the matroid and it's and the matroid after I after I act on it. Um, so that's what a valuative invariant is. And by looking at these, it means we kind of don't need to worry about the fact that we came up with Schubert matroids up to up to permutation, because now um, we can we kind of like take the whole orbit as as one thing. Um, and so we have sort of a basis that's in indexed by these Schubert matroids. Um, so yeah, this um, might be a silly question, but is, is a Schubert matroid a matroid? Yes. It is. Yeah. Okay. But it's yeah, but not like all the matroids, right? It's Even not all the matroids. No. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, you can think of it in, in terms of the bases. Um, if you know about matroids, you can think of it as like you, you pick, um, a minimal, a lexicographically minimal basis, and then you have to have like every other thing that's lexicographically bigger than that is also a basis. And yeah, and you and it's you should think about why that would give you a matroid, I guess. But but it will, yeah. Um. So um. Okay, so Dirksen and Fink um, use this to de describe the universal valuative matroid invariant. 
um, in their paper. And um, except um, they, so they wrote it out this way, which is not the polytopal view, but I'm going to talk about this for a second and then I'll, I'll give the polytopal view as I promised in the title of my talk. Um, so, so how they defined the universal value to matroid invariant was that it maps a matroid to the sum over all complete flags of subsets of N. And then um, for each flag, I get sort of a rank sequence by taking the difference between um, the ranks of subsequent subsets in the flag. Now, I didn't define what the rank of, of a subset was yet. So if you know about rank functions of matroids, you should think of that. And if you don't know about that, then I'm about to give the polytopal view. So hopefully that will be a little better. Um, but, but so they showed that this was the universal valuative matroid invariant. Another way to think about this is that this is going to be um, a formal sum over all of the Schubert matroids such that um, some element in the orbit of that Schubert matroid contains your matroid M. Um, and so basically we get this from the generalized permutahedra evaluation by intersecting everything with the uniform matroid and then we get these Schubert matroids. Um, so why are these the same? They look really different. Um, so the way you can think about this is that um, these flags of subsets X are the same as, so taking a complete flag of subsets of N is the same as taking a permutation of N because you can, you can just take the permutation like the, the ele you can take the elements in the order of like how they're added to the subsets to get the flag. Um, and a permutation of N is the same as a vertex of the permutahedron. So what we can do is we can take for each flag of subsets, this gives us a vertex of the permutahedron or a tangent cone at that vertex of the permutahedron. Um, and then um, we can intersect each of those with, with the uniform matroid. And there's gonna be like one or, yeah. Yeah, so basically for each of these, we get a tangent cone of the permutahedron. And then when we intersect everything with the uniform matroid, um, this is where these Schubert matroids arise. Um, so that's kind of the how these two different definitions relate. But this is what Dirksen and Fink showed. Um, they showed this, this value to invariant. Um, so what we wanted to do, what we wanted to do was um, um, extend this to coxeter matroids, um, which I haven't defined yet, but I will now. Um, so I'm, there's, again, there's ways of thinking about coxeter matroids sort of algebraically. And if you know about that, then you should think about that. But I'm going to define them in kind of a roundabout way as certain polytopes um, for the purposes of this talk. So, um, so again, let's say I have a root system phi. Um, and it has its corresponding reflection group W. Um, well, root systems come with special points called fundamental weights. So in type A for the symmetric group, the fundamental weights will be E1, E1 plus E2, E1 plus E2 plus E3, and so on. And so the uniform or a uniform phi matroid will be the convex hull of the W orbit of some fundamental weight. And so you can think in type A, um, w is Sn and our fundamental weight is some, some 0, 1 vec vector that has like R1s and then N minus R0s. And when I take the whole orbit, I get all of the, the vectors with R1s and N minus R0s. We have a quick um, question from yeah. Seth, which is, is a coxeter matroid a matroid? Um, not, it's, um, it's not a matroid in the definition of matroid that I, that I gave before. This is like a more general definition. Um, so yeah, so so it has, it, it's like, it's like what you would get if you wanted to define a matroid that instead of having a natural SN action, it has like a natural action by some other reflection group. Um, so it's not a matroid in the sense of like what we usually would think of as a matroid. Yeah. Um, so and I think, so he's actually clarifying, um, he's talking about a classical matroid. So I, I imagine that's 
like this idea that you have bases and you have the basis exchange property. So does it? Yeah. So there's, there's a different, um, there's like a Coxeter version of that, that you can do, which, um, which instead of using like sets and like subsets of the set, it takes your Coxeter group and it had you like take cosets of the Coxeter group and you can discuss or sorry parabolic cosets of parabolic subgroups in the Coxeter group and you can describe it that way. So there's an analogous definition to the the thing with bases in in type A, but um, it's not you can't um, you can't use the basis the type A basis definition to define um, a Coxeter matroid. You need to use like the more general definition. Thanks for that. that was a good question. Thank you. Um, so, um, so, okay, so that I defined a uniform Coxeter matroid and now I'm going to define a Coxeter matroid to be a polytope whose vertices are vertices of a uniform Coxeter matroid, some subset of the vertices, and the edge directions have to be roots in your root system. So here's two examples um, in type B2. So the first, the left example is a, the uniform matroid or a uniform matroid in type B2. So here I took the point one zero and I reflect across all of the possible hyperplanes that you have in B2 um, and I get this like diamond shape. Um, and then the one on the right is a Coxeter matroid. It's a, you can see that it's, um, its vertices are a subset of the vertices of the original matroid. And um, the edge directions are also roots in B2. Um, so, so these are two examples of, of Coxeter matroid polytopes. Um, so, so we wanted to come up with the universal valuation of Coxeter matroids. Um, and so the first natural question to ask is, can we take the same approach as Dirksen and Fink did in type A, where they um, took the valuation for generalized permutahedra and they just intersected it with uniform matroids? And the answer is that this doesn't work in general in other types. Um, so, and the problem is that in, in general Coxeter types, if you take a uniform matroid and you intersect it with a tangent cone of the Coxeter permutahedron, you don't even necessarily get, um, I mean, you don't necessarily get a Coxeter matroid, you don't even necessarily get a generalized Coxeter permutahedron. So here's um, a bad example. Um, so you can see it's kind of all like inscribed in a cube, but you can try to ignore the, the cube markings. Um, and so we have um, this, this polytope that has square and triangle faces. This is a uniform matroid of type B3. And then I'm intersecting it with a tangent cone of the B3 permutahedron at, and I sort of, and it's translated to be, have its point be at this sort of vertex that's most in the foreground, if you can picture that. And so then I have, um, I, I position the tangent cone, so it's, it's translated, so its vertex, its point is at that vertex, and I intersect it with this, this um, uniform matroid. And what I get is I get this little red polytope that I've pictured here. And you can see that this is pretty bad because there's, there's new vertices that were not in the uniform matroid. The two, you can see the two in the, on the square face on the top. Um, you also get bad edge directions. So the one kind of in the front that splits this triangle, um, that edge direction is not um, in the type B3 root system. Um, and so that means that this is not, this red polytope is not a B3 matroid and it's not even a generalized B3 permutahedron. Um, and so this approach that Dirksen and Fink used in type A just doesn't work for other Coxeter types. Um, but fortunately, we were able to um, come up with an analogous result to Dirksen and Fink's result um, um, for type A, but we just needed to use different proof techniques than what they used. So we needed to sort of detour through zero Hecke algebras in order to prove some, some facts about um, these Coxeter Schubert matroids that I'm about to define. Um, so, uh, so, 
So our we came up with this theorem that the universal valuative coxeter matroid invariant um, is given by taking a matroid and I'm going to map it to um, the sum over all the elements of the reflection group and I'm going to look for the um, minimum vertex of the, the matroid with respect to that, um, that uh, element of the reflection group. So if you're familiar with Coxeter groups, you should think of like the Bruja order shifted by W inverse here. Um, so that's the not polytopal view, but let me give the polytopal view. So another way to think about this, just like in type A, is that we have these uh, matroids called Coxeter Schubert matroids. Um, and we get these by basically choosing a minimal element of the reflection group um, and a fundamental weight. And then we're going to just um, take the convex hull of U acting on the fundamental weight for all U that are bigger than our chosen minimal element W in the Bruja order. Um, and so, um, oops, yeah, and so, um, this, our universal valuative matroid invariant is the same as summing over all of the, um, the Coxeter Schubert matroids such that um, for some translation or some permutation of that matroid, it contains M. Um, so, so that was our results about the universal valuative invariant of Coxeter matroids. So as an application, um, we were able to prove something about the interlace polynomial, which is a type B, so it's a certain type of, um, of invariant on um, delta matroids, which are a certain type of type BN matroids. So, um, I, so as I defined a matroid, I said that um, it needs to have vertices that are vertices of some uniform matroid and it needs to have edge directions in the root system. So here, um, a delta matroid is going to be a type BN matroid that, um, whose vertices are in this set. So if you take all of these, you get one of the type BN uniform matroids. And if you don't take all of them um, and you still have the correct edge directions, then you get a delta matroid. So there is this um, uh, valuation that, or invariant, there's this invariant that, that people like to study on delta matroids, which is called the interlace polynomial. And so as an application of our, of our theorem, we were able to show that the interlace polynomial is a specialization of the G invariant. And so this means that it's a valuative invariant on delta matroids. Um, so, so that was one application of, of our theorem. So I think that is everything that I have. So these are some of our references. And thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you. That's all. Thank the speaker. Are there any questions for Marielle? OK, Vic has one. Uh, Vic, do you want to say it for the sake of the recording? I was wondering, um, are these, uh, the Coxeter Schubert matroids, are they part of this family of polytopes that uh, Lauren Williams and her student Zuckerman studied, these things called Bruja interval polytopes? Yeah, yeah, there's certain Bruja interval polytopes, yeah. Are there other questions? I had like a, question. I don't think about Coxeter groups a lot, so the root system stuff's a little uh, in, uh, different for me. Um, but in your definition of Coxeter matroids, I can't remember the word. It was like fundamental point? Fundamental, fundamental weight. weight. Yeah. So I noticed the definition, you like make a choice of a fundamental weight. Does mm -hmm. making a different choice change the resulting uh, structure of what you get? Yeah, so so what you can think of this is like um, the choice of the fundamental weight kind of corresponds to to the rank. So so there's not really like a um, a good notion or like a well studied notion of rank of a coxeter matroid, but it's kind of a like in type A, um, 
the fundamental weights are E1, E1 plus E2, E1 plus E2 plus E3. So choosing one of them tells me like how many ones I have and oh, that's the same as the rank. And so, so analogously, you can think of the different, choosing the different fundamental weights as being like the different possible ranks of the coxeter matroid, even though I didn't, I don't really, I wouldn't really like use the word rank, but no, maybe I see, you could, yeah. I see what you're saying. Does that also change, because you're taking like the convex hull, does it change anything geometrically about the object too? Or is it just like what the points look like in that case? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. Okay, yeah. So this, in this example here, um, at the bottom of this slide, um, this is one possible choice of fundamental weight. So I, I chose one zero as the fundamental weight. And then, so that's, you can see that's one of the vertices. And then you act on it, you've got all the other vertices. So if I'd chosen the other fundamental weight for B2, I believe it's one half, one half, then I would get a different thing. I would get like a different square um, whose vertices are like one half, one half, minus one half. It would like be reflecting it across all the different axes, basically. Um, and and so yeah, it would it would be. I mean, in this case, it would still be a square, but it also like this is because it's so low dimensional. It could also be like a different combinatorially a different polytope too. Yeah. Cool. So thanks. So Vic asked another question. I'll, I'll read it. Um, since set polynomials of usual matroids are certain kinds of valuative invariants, does this work suggest analogs of tet polynomial for other types? Thank you for asking that. Um, we we didn't like we weren't able to like come up with that yet, but it's definitely something I'm really interested in in thinking more about. Yeah, um, I think Dirksen and Fink. Um, had an expression for the the tut polynomial in terms of their g invariant, and so yeah, so I'm I would definitely be interested in, um, or I am interested and have thought a little bit about like how you could uh, generalize that to other types, but but we haven't figured out anything about that yet. Yeah. Are there any other questions? All right, before we thank then uh, Mario one more time, let me just uh, mention what Alex mentioned uh, before the talk. Um, so on September 24, we'll have a panel discussion on the academic job search. Uh, where we'll have um, Sunita Chipuri, Chris Ir, who was uh, mentioned in the work today, um, Bennett Gorkner and Julie Vega, um, and they'll be discussing their stuff, um, well, their, their process to applying to academic jobs. And so that'll be on September 24th um, from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. So if you're uh, curious about that, please join us. And then next week, um, to, uh, next week's talk will be by Sophia Elia uh, from FU Berlin. And she'll be talking about the congruence normality for simplicial hyperplane arrangements. So hope that you can join us also next week. Um, but yeah. Let's thank Maria one more time for that lovely talk. All right.